Universal Center for Renovation presents Historical Israelites. This is strictly for educational purposes and commentary of biblical and secular historical literature. So enjoy. Gulot Edom, the captivity of Edom, the last captivity of Israel, from 70 AD to 1492, to this present time, today. First off, I would like to explain the meaning behind this video, Gulot Edom, the exile of Edom, the last captivity of Israel. I would like to explain that the perspective of this narrative is from a Jewish perspective. And what I mean by Jewish is pertaining to the southern kingdom of Judah, either Judah, Benjamin, or Levi. I've never belong to any Christian denomination. I'm not a Southern Baptist. I'm not from the South. Although I reside in the Southeast now, I spent the first 19 years of my life in New York City, where I was born. I grew up in the South Bronx. My parents, my mother, my father, my mother is from Harlem, New York. My father is from Missouri, but he moved to Harlem at the age of 12. There are schools and synagogues that cater or teach people of color throughout Harlem. Or it's better to say there was. So I was a native New Yorker. So this knowledge or idea of being Israel and a person of color was something that I knew my whole life. I knew people of all philosophical points of views, people that were fiber sinners people that were nation of Islam, Buddhists, Krishnas, Catholics, all different types of views. And of course, people who were Jews of color. I had one handicap. I knew my family history really well. For example, my paternal line, my father line, he's not originally or I should say the family is not originally from Missouri, even though he lived in Missouri. His father is from Illinois and his father is from Oklahoma. On paper, we can document our family living in Oklahoma as far as 1830, which means our family walked the trial of tears as Cherokees. But without a doubt, we're physically what you would call black Americans. But we are not only Cherokees, we're also Kickapoo, which means my grandfather, grandmother was Native American Indian and also Mexican Indian. And way before 1830, the family name is anglicized now, but at once upon a time, it was French. The last name, the surname was French and the family changed it way before 1830. So with the family oral history, there's some information, but it's not clear about some Haitian ancestors, maybe around the time 
the Haitian Revolution with the French Empire around the time of Napoleon. And one of the reason is not so clear is because my family, on my father paternal line, was classified as free people of color. And to further complicate matters, my father's mother and her personal family tree, she has President Thomas Jefferson, along with the inventor, Robert Fulton, and Robert Fulton married into the Livingston family of New York. Thomas Jefferson can trace his family line through his mother, who was a Randolph, the first Virginia family Randolphs. He can trace his family line back to the Stuart Kings of Scotland and England. King James was a Scotland king or Scottish. So Thomas Jefferson can trace his line to uh, royalty in Europe, in England. And going back to Robert Fulton, who did not invent the steam engine, but he commercialized it. Married into the Livingston family of New York, who was the core of the establishment of this country from colonial days. Other families related to the Livingstons are families like the Astors, the Vanderbilts, Van Cortlands. Uh, pretty much anyone in this place who were of old money, the, the people that founded DL. All these people, all these families married into the Livingston family. My father's mother comes out of that bloodline. So there's knowledge and experience that you gain from being exposed to certain type of people. And going back to my parents, my mother and father, they were married in Sumpner, South Carolina. And so was my grandparents. And Sumpner, South Carolina, have a history for having a class of people known as free people of color who were investigated and found out to be descended from Portuguese. And we know these Portuguese were Jews of color. So there's an interesting history that, that, or that took place in South Carolina, as well as other places in this country. And to get to the point, I was trying to state that I've always known through family, relatives, and friends that the Israelites were people of color. By the time I was 13 or 14, I was introduced to the idea of Native Americans throughout North America, the Caribbean, Central and South America, was also descendants of Israelites, which made perfect sense to me because I'm from the South Bronx and I have blood relatives who are from Jamaica, the Virgin Islands, and other parts of the Caribbean, who are Puerto Rican, Dominican, Haitian. So I was really familiar with all these types that they call Spanish or indigenous Indians of the America or Americas. And also family from Panama. And this idea suited me well because my family on my father's side is of 
so-called black American and indigenous Native American Cherokee Kickapoo descent. So I saw where I actually fit into this scenario because if there's only so-called blacks that fit into this scenario, how do I fit in when my family is also indigenous, black, and Cherokee? But nevertheless, I studied in schools in Harlem that taught about the history of the Israelites as people of color. And in that school, I learned the fundamentals of the Hebrew language, the Hebrew customs, and Hebrew history and their relationship with each other and the nations of the world, and most importantly, the Most High and his son. Another factor is, I believed in the Old Testament and the New Testament, as well as the Apocrypha. So some schools of Jewish thought does not believe the Messiah had come yet, but I did. So I would have to attend a school that also believed in the New Testament. But since I was never by denomination Christian, my earliest education from when I was a child was reading the Bible from a Israelite or Jewish perspective. Reading about Samson, Moses, David, the prophets, Paul, John, all from a Hebrew perspective. So this narrative, this video is from a Hebrew or Jewish perspective from Hebrew scholars and some Christian scholars who understood the nature of how the Israelites saw the world. Not as a so-called black American or Native American or Latino American or Caribbean American, but as a man or person who saw themselves connected by bloodline to the ancient Israelites. So going back to the thumbnail, on the right, the first is a Jew or someone of the tribe of Benjamin or Levi who was just taken into captivity by Rome in 70 AD when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. The man, the image of the man is of a man who has pride and strength about himself but is in total shock because he is being led away into captivity. And he hasn't processed this idea just fully yet. The image of this man is one of his head is down. He's, he's, in, he's dejected. He's in shock and horror. This man might have been a nobleman, a priest, soldier, a warrior, a businessman, a merchant. But now, he's a slave. The image in the center is of a 
Native American, indigenous, and a so-called black man of the transatlantic slave trade. Representing the Northern Kingdom, the Indians, and the Southern Kingdom, the so-called Negroes. And this is a pivotal point in time, 1492. The Spanish Inquisition has kicked the Jews out of Spain. Columbus came to the Americas looking for the Ten Tribes. Manasseh bin Israel, another Jewish scholar, omitted that the Ten Tribes resides in the Americas. And this point, this image is different from the 70 AD image. At this point, the man is on his knees. This form of slavery, this form of chattel slavery has this man on his knees looking for hope. The pride is gone. The shock is gone. He only realizes that this seems to be an impossible situation. The only good point of this is the Native Americans, the Ten Tribes, are there too. Fulfilling prophecy of how the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom would be oppressed together. Not taking away anything from Israel that's scattered around the world. In Europe, in Asia, Japan, China, India, Africa. People like the Celts, like the Sicilians or Italians. But this prophecy of Judah and Ephraim being oppressed together is displayed in this image. And this last image is today of the Israelite, whatever tribe. From whatever continent. Fully Romanized. He's a Roman. He's standing up. Because he's fully. Immersed. In materialism. Atheism. Lack of belief. And lack of faith. A slave. A slave in a sophisticated, technological prison. Because Rome is not just a people group. Rome is a idea. The Shin Gold Jewish Encyclopedia, a richly illustrated reference guide, authoritative, up-to-date, covering Jewish life and culture from ancient times to the present. The Shingold Jewish Encyclopedia, Section G. The Shin Gold Jewish Encyclopedia, Section G, page 89. Under the definition of Golot, Golot or Gola from Hebrew meaning exile, the lands where Jews lived outside of the land of Israel were called Golot. In early times, Golot also referred to the people in exile or captivity. Jewish sages called Israel's stay in Egypt Golot Mitzrayim or 
Egyptian captivity. The second Golod of Babylonia lasted 70 years. From 586 to 516 BCE. The year of the rebuilding of the second temple. The third exile from the destruction of the second temple in 70 BC to the present day is called Golot Edom. The Shin Gold Jewish Encyclopedia Section I In gathering of the exiles in Hebrew Kibbutz Gal Yulat The hope for the reunion of the people of Israel in the land of Israel is fundamental to the prophetic idea of redemption. The redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. And joy shall be upon their head. Isaiah chapter 51 verse 11. For centuries, Jewish prayers echoed the fervent desire for the ingathering of the exiles. Sound the great trumpet for our freedom and gather us from the four corners of the earth. Kabad.org Jewish History Essays on Jewish History Discovered the four exiles of the Jewish people. The History of Galut For almost as long as the Jewish nation has existed, it has been persecuted and forced to wander from land to land, starting with slavery in Egypt to the destruction of both temples in Jerusalem. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. The destruction of Jerusalem and the temple built by King Solomon at the hands of the Babylonians, 587 B.C. The destruction of the temple in Jerusalem by the Romans, 70 A.D. These times of national displacement are known in Hebrew as Galot, exile. The four primary periods of exile are known as Arba Galulat, the four exiles. Don't forget this narrative is from a Jewish point of view. The four kingdoms of Daniel or the four exiles. The four exiles. The prophet Daniel had a vision that suddenly hints to the four exiles of the Jewish nation. I saw in my vision by night four great beasts. The first was like a lion. Behold, another beast, a second one, similar to a bear. Afterwards, I beheld, and there was another, similar to a leopard. And after that, as I looked on in the night vision, there was a fourth beast, fearsome, dreadful and very powerful in Daniel's prophecy each creature 
symbolizes an exile that the Jewish people were to undergo. The first was Babylon, the second Media Persia, the third Greece, and finally Edom, commonly identified as Rome. And this article has been interesting. The authors of this article are from the Kabad set of Jewish scholars. Rome, 69 CE to the present. Vexiloid of the Roman Empire. A vexiloid is a standard or flag. So this is the standard or flag of the Roman Empire. A map of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire brought the final blow for Jewish sovereignty in Israel and the final exile for the Jews, one that has lasted for nearly 2,000 years and has not yet ended. The Jewish people during that time was split into four factions, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Sakari, and Zealots. Some of these groups began rebelling against the mighty empire. The Emperor Nero saw this as treason and sent his best general, Vespasian, along with his son Titus and 60,000 Roman soldiers to quell the revolt. The Roman Emperor Vespasian minted a coin to celebrate his victory over the Jews. Judea capture coin, 71 AD. The dispute of exiles. So what exactly constitutes an exile? As mentioned above, the Jewish people were exiled from a few countries in Europe. Why don't they fall into that count? All opinions agree with the identities of the first three exiles as they are clearly inferred from the book of Daniel. The controversy revolves around the identity of the fourth and final exile, which is referred to as Edom. All the sages agree that the word Edom typically refers to the Romans. In contrast to this, Nechmanis maintains that the Empire of Rome was the last exile the Jewish people endured. Nechmanis explains that the four kingdoms are not defined by their power or strength, but by the fact that they placed the Jews in exile in the first place. He comes to this conclusion because despite the many other threats to our existence that came after the Romans, we have not yet been redeemed from this specific exile. Moses ben Nachman, 1194 to 1270, also referred to by the acronym Rem Ban. He was a leading medieval Jewish scholar, Catalan, Spanish rabbi, philosopher, physician, and biblical commentator. And this is another article from Kabad.org. These are a group of Hasidic Jewish mystic writers and scholars living with Moshiach, Vishlak, 
Number two. The present Gulat is referred to as Gulat Edom, the Edomite exile. Because the Romans who brought about the present Gulat with their destruction of the Holy Temple were mostly descendants of Edom. The Gulat or this Gulat is generally divided into two eras, governed by two kinds of chieftain leaders as mentioned in the verse cited. So the Hasidic believes that there will be two eras of Roman rule, the ancient and the modern. In the first era of the Edomite Golat, the Roman Empire expanded throughout the world, seeking to overpower Judaism and to make it difficult for Jews to observe Torah and mitzvah or commands, commandments. This referred to the second era of the Edomite Gulat. So they believe there was an ancient rule of Rome and a modern rule of Rome. So this second rulership of Rome, this refers to the second era of the Edomite Gulat, the one close to the Masonic days. So they believe in the second era or rulership of the Roman period would be basically the last days, the time that the Messiah would return. This is an article from Wikipedia. It's entitled Jewish Diaspora. The Jewish Diaspora, or Exa, in Hebrew, Galut, is the biblical dispersion of Israelites or Jews out of their ancient ancestral homeland, the land of Israel, and their subsequent settlement in other parts of the globe. In terms of the Hebrew Bible, the term exile denotes the fate of the Israelites who were taken into exile from the kingdom of Israel during the 8th century BCE and the Judites from the kingdom of Judah, who were taken into exile during the 6th century BCE. While in exile, the Judites became known as Jews. Mordecai, the Jew from the book of Esther, being the first biblical mention of the term Jew. Diaspora, exile, galut. It's the same expression of the term or idea of Israelites being exiled or taken into captivity outside their land. The first exile was the Assyrian exile. The expulsion from the kingdom of Israel or the land of Samaria begun by Tiglath Pileser III of Assyria in 733 BCE. This process was completed by Sargon II with the destruction of the kingdom in 722 BCE, concluding a three year siege of Samaria begun by Shalmaneser V. The next experience of exile was the Babylonian captivity in which portions of the population of the kingdom of Judah was deported in 597 BCE and again in 586 BCE by the Neo-Babylonian Empire under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar II. A Jewish diaspora existed for several centuries before the fall of the Second Temple, and their dwelling in other countries, for the most part, was not a result of compulsory dislocation. Before the middle of the first century CE, in addition to Judea, Syria, and Babylonia, 
large Jewish communities existed in the Roman provinces of Egypt, Crete, and Cyrenica, and in Rome itself. After the siege of Jerusalem in 63 BCE, when the Hasmonean kingdom became a protectorate of Rome, immigration intensified. In the year 6 CE or AD, the region was organized as the Roman province of Judea. The Judean population revolted against the Roman Empire in 66 CE in the First Jewish-Roman War, which culminated in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 CE. During the siege, the Romans destroyed the Second Temple and most of Jerusalem. Those previous articles were from the perspective of Jewish scholars. This book is from the perspective of a Christian historian and scholar. The Old Paths or the Talmud tested by Scripture being a comparison the principles and doctrines of modern Judaism with the religion of Moses and the prophets by the Reverend Alexander McCall, 1880, by London Society's House, London. This author seems to understand that Strong dislike is shown towards Esau, Jacob's brother. So he's trying to understand why. So let's start at this point. His dominion also will be greatly exalted. He being the most high. And his throne be completely established. When he shall smite the descendants of Esau and take vengeance on his enemy or enemies. So a question is also put forth. But these are sufficient to show that Edom is the great object of antipathy. And of course, the great question is, whom do the Jews understand by Edom? Or who are the children of Edom? So the writer goes on. Let the most famous of their rabbis instruct us in this matter. So let's hear this from a Jewish point of view. And first, let us hear my Maimonides. The prophet mentions Egypt and Edom. Egypt on account of the Turks. At this point in time, the Arabs and their empires controlled Egypt. The prophet mentions Egypt and Edom. Egypt on account of the Turks and Edom on account of the Roman Empire. And these two have now had dominion for a long time and will continue until the redemption. This is the fourth beast in the visions of Daniel. And this is said because the majority of the Roman Empire is composed of Edomites. For though Many other nations are mixed among them, as is also the case with the Turkish Empire. They are called after the root. 
Kimichi, another scholar around the time of the Crusades from southern France, then fixes Edom upon the Roman Empire, in which he evidently includes the Greek Empire. So, Kimichi, during the medieval time period, lists the Romans and the Greeks as children of Esau or Edom. The fourth beast, the Roman Empire, composed of Edomites from a Jewish perspective. During the medieval period and time. This scholar lived in southern France. Now let's turn to Dr. William Smith's Dictionary of the Bible. William Smith was an English scholar who lived from 1813 to 1893. If we look up the prophet Obadiah in Dr. William Smith Dictionary and the article about the book of Obadiah, there's some very interesting comments that are made about the identity of Edom. And in a dictionary, you can see Obadiah means Servant of Jehovah. But as students of Hebrew, we know Hebrew doesn't have a letter J. So the pronunciation of the name Jehovah would be in the old ancient Paleo Hebrew, Yahweh. So Obadiah means servant of Yahweh. And the pronunciation of Obadiah would be Abadiah. Abadiah. So this is an excerpt from the William Smith Bible Dictionary from the article Obadiah. The book of Obadiah is a sustained denunciation of the Edomites. Melting, as is the want or known of the Hebrew prophets, into a vision of the future glories of Zion. When the arm of the Lord should have wrought her deliverance and have repaid double upon her enemies. Previous to the captivity, the Edomites were in a similar relation to the Jews to that which the Samaritans afterwards held. They were near neighbors and they were relatives. Here is an image of ruins of ancient Rome. The prophets prophesied about the fall of Rome but they also prophesize about Rome coming into a second existence or a second life. Rome being reborn in the last days. So let us continue in William Smith Dictionary, Obadiah. The book of of Obadiah is a favorite study of the modern Jews. It is here especially that they read the future fate of their own nation and of the Christians. Those unversed in their literature may wonder where the Christians are found in the book of Obadiah, but it is a fixed principle of rabbinical interpretation that by Edomites is 
prophetically meant Christians. And that by Edom is meant Rome. Thus, Kimichi, the scholar Kimichi on Obadiah lays it down that all that the prophets have said about the destruction of Edom in the last times or the last days has reference to Rome. Once again, William Smith, Bible Dictionary, Obadiah. The reasons of this rabbinical dictum are as various and as ridiculous as might be imagined. But it's not ridiculous. It's the Hebrew perspective and understanding of history and prophetic thinking. Nek, Menides, Bekhai, and Abelbanel, all Jewish scholars, say that Janus, the first king of Latium, was grandson of Esau. Kamichi, another Jewish scholar, says that Julius Caesar was an Idumean. Roman Emperor Julius Caesar was an Idumean or an Edomite, according to Jewish scholars. And this is a painting showing the triumph of Titus, son of Vespasian, over Judea in 70 AD. The menorah was taken from the temple in Jerusalem and brought to Rome. Obadiah, William Smith, Dictionary, Obadiah, Article. The Jews, both those who are comparatively ancient, the ancient Jews 2,000 years ago, and those who are modern today, believe that Titus was an Edomite. And when the prophets denounce Edom, they frequently refer it to Titus. Roman Emperor Titus. Titus was an Edomite. Division of the Roman Empire. Borders of the Roman Empire in 395 CE or AD under Emperor Theodosius, Western and Eastern Roman Empire. William Smith Dictionary, final quote. I have several times shown that from Edom proceeded the kings who reigned in Italy and who built up Rome to be great among the nations and chief among the provinces. And in this way, Italy and Greece and all the Western provinces became filled with Idumeans. Western and Eastern Roman Empire became filled with Idumeans. The King James Version Bible, 1611, and a Torah scroll. The ancient Romans used philosophy and warfare 
with their legions, their armies, to control the bodies and minds of their subjects. But the truth is here to set us free so we can understand history from an Israelite perspective, from a Jewish perspective, from the perspective of the Jews. John chapter 8, verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4. And he shall judge among the nations, he the Most High and his Son, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. The Roman ideal of a man being a wolf to his brother is symbolized by the she-wolf that fed Romulus and Remus. But Isaiah prophesied a time where mankind, all the nations will live in peace. And the ideal of materialism, atheism, and a man living as a wolf to his brother, that day shall cease. That ideal that Rome gave to the world will cease to exist. And there will be a brotherhood among men.